All right, so today we are going to be conducting a rhetorical analysis of Taylor Swift's blank space. And you'll notice at the very beginning of the video, before things even take off, there is a car pulling up, and this is already important. Uh, we're already setting something in motion here. This car, this is a Shelby AC Cobra. This is a rare and vintage car. It is uh, from the 60s. It's at least 100K. And there is this gentleman who walks out of the car. The question you should be asking is, who is he? Why does he drive this car? What does the car say about him? Is he rare and vintage? Is he from the 60s? And that's the whole point of this comparison, right? There is a rhetorical device happening before the video even really takes off. There is a comparison happening. He's not driving a limo. This guy is not a limo. He is not a Hummer. He is not a convertible. He is a Shelby AC Cobra. He is rare and vintage. Okay. And we move on to a shot of Taylor. There she is with a cat. And notice the breakfast in bed. Uh, and, and usually when we see cute baby animals like this, they yield pathos, right? Because it's adorable. It forces you to emote and to feel badly or sad or something for the cat and the person holding the cat. But here, this is a little bit different. If you take a look at the entire context, we have Taylor Swift, breakfast in bed, this cat that she's got just kind of draped over her hand. Uh, it tells us something about her, much like the car tells us that that gentleman outside, um, he may be rare and vintage. We see her, we see Taylor, whoever this person is supposed to be, as someone who is high maintenance, definitely. If that doesn't scream high maintenance to you, I don't know what does. So this is a nice opportunity to think about the difference between the uh, speaker and the person who is uh, delivering the message and, uh, in, in this case, the artist. So it's packaged a little bit differently when it's happening in a book or in a, an article. Um, in this case, we have singer Taylor Swift, and we have the person who is supposed to be singing the song, right? This is like the fictional character in the book. What's a little bit confusing about this particular song and, and what's really interesting interesting about it is that it's still Taylor Swift, except it's the media's portrayal of Taylor Swift. So uh, there is, there's a lot of layers happening here. Taylor Swift is the singer, um, and she is not necessarily our speaker, although she is also our speaker, the fictional media version. If we think about the rhetorical triangle here, Taylor would be the speaker, and it's always important to consider this as you move into a rhetorical analysis. Uh, the audience, that's, that's you and me. That's her target audience. Probably more than anyone, her fan base, which would be teenage girls, right? But it's really anyone who listens to the radio at this point because she's so popular, and she must be delivering some kind of message. We don't know what that message is yet. And uh, it might be about the disconnect between who she really is and who she's portrayed as in the media, but we don't really know because we haven't taken it apart yet. So let's go ahead and take it apart. Nice to meet you. Where you been? All right. So the first line of the song, Taylor says, nice to meet you where you've been. This is very meta. She's already setting up a paradox and we're going to find very quickly that that is her go-to weapon of choice. That is her rhetorical device that she uses again and again throughout this entire song and this entire video. It's paradox, right? She says, nice to meet you where you've been. That's contradictory. Why would you care where he has been if you've never met him before? Unless you're implying that you knew all along that you would be meeting him. You've been waiting for him even though you never knew who he was. So this is the first of a number of paradoxes that will come up, but they all build to one big point or purpose, we hope. I can show you incredible things. Taylor says that she can show him incredible things, and we have this very interesting, compelling, interesting, strange shot of horses in a bedroom, and... Um, uh, that kind of verifies the point, right? There are some uh, <laughs> some incredible things. And maybe the point that Taylor is making here really verifies that disconnect between who Taylor Swift is, singer-songwriter, and Taylor Swift fictional character as portrayed by the media as absolutely ridiculous. Um, you know, and what better way to portray that than putting two horses in a bedroom? That's insane. Magic, madness, heaven, sin. Taylor Swift goes on to bring a few different paradoxes in here. She compares heaven and sins. She brings in magic and madness. And all of these things imply one of two things about her. Either that she's a, an incredibly worldly person that can show him things he's never even imagined possible. Or that she's mildly schizophrenic. 
And maybe that is another disconnect, another difference between the real Taylor Swift and the Taylor Swift the media likes to portray. So she goes on to say, look at that face. And that's also very interesting because what's happening here is Taylor starts to go on a rant about superficial features. It's not look at that personality or look at that sense of humor. So Taylor Swift, fictional media representation here, seems to care very much about surface level stuff. Uh, she says, you look like you're my next mistake, which also implies a few things. One, that this man is uh, objectified. Uh, he's not a person. He's a mistake. He's just another thing to be had by her. And two, that there are previous mistakes, right? That Taylor Swift is just one series of long-winded awful mistakes and here's another one of them um and again that starts to speak to what she's actually trying to do here by setting up all these paradoxes and by making this ridiculous image of herself it's a satire which is actually very interesting considering jonathan swift so they have the same last name i had i just realized that in the middle of that sentence which is which is mind-boggling if you don't know who jonathan swift is modest proposal look him up immediately and your mind will be blown Now, this next part I love, and I love The Great Gatsby, and so maybe that's part of why. It's a very Gatsby verse. She says, new money, suit and tie. I can read you like a magazine. And again, this is very superficial. Think about how you read magazines. It's not, I can read you like a novel. I can read you like a book. I can read you like the Bible. Uh, it's, I can read you like a magazine, like something that is designed for entertainment and superficial reading while I'm waiting at the dentist's office. Uh, she also says, ain't it funny, rumors fly. And I know you've heard about me. And this is also interesting because one, rumors, right? If you've read Gatsby yet, then you know that this is, this is what it's all about. And the relationship she has with this person is very similar to Daisy Buchanan's relationship with Jay Gatsby. Uh, no spoilers if you haven't read it yet. She references rumors, and this almost breaks that fourth wall. It doesn't yet, but it makes a very explicit reference to what the media has been doing as far as creating rumors and building this character, this, this false Taylor Swift, that, or at least that's what she's claiming here in this song. Can make the bad guys good for a weekend. She does it again. There is another paradox, and and she does this a few times in a very strong way. This is one of her biggest hooks in the song. She says, "I could make the bad guys good for a weekend." So here, the paradox continues, but with a little bit more purpose, and the message is a little clearer. She isn't schizophrenic for schizophrenia's sake. Uh, apparently, it's a good thing. It's appealing, and perhaps that is Media Taylor's message to us, that the bad guys can and want to be made good, that her contradictory nature is what they are after, that they want heaven and hell, not just heaven, that they want magic and madness, and they want both the bad and the good, with Media Taylor and perhaps Genuine Taylor at the same time. Maybe that is what is so compelling about Taylor Swift. Uh, and this continues throughout the chorus. So it's going to be forever or it's going to go down in flames. Was the high worth the pain, etc. So it's going to be forever or it's going to go down in flames. You can tell me when it's over. Mm -hmm. If the high was worth the pain. Got a long list of ex-lovers. They'll tell you I'm insane. Because you know I love the players. And you love the game. Because we're young and we're reckless. Okay, there are more paradoxes that happen. I'm going to stop pointing them out here. You're going to hear them every time you hear the song. It's all you're going to be able to think about. It will leave you breathless or with a nasty scar, etc. Paradox city, paradox, paradox. What 
you want be that girl for a month okay now she starts to build a larger paradox right she says i will find out who it is that you want me to be quote find out what you want be that girl for a month right and i will be here but only for a fleeting and very short temporary kind of time she herself is becoming the paradox right the thing that you want and that you cannot have although she'll pretend to let you have it right it's a, it's a very complex kind of thing the worst is yet to come. okay now we're going to actually reference the film here the cell phone i love this uh and this is i think one of the the best moments in this video for many reasons um rhetorically the cell phone right there's so much power in that here um there's depth that happens to, to her argument because he now seems to be giving her precisely the same thing that she has been giving him, right? And it's not very obvious at first glance, but if you think about it, we only catch a small glimpse of it. But Mr. Rare Vintage Car, Mr. New Money, Mr. Fancy Pants has found out what she wants, right? And has been that person for the duration of the song uh, for a month, right? As she said, and is now breaking through that shell. Who is he texting is the question. Oh, no. Oh. And here come a battery of little paradoxes that, you know, drive that point home. The perfect storm, the rose and thorns, etc. Can make all the tables turn, rose garden filled with thorns. Keep you second guessing like, oh my God, who is she? I get drunk on jealousy, but you'll come back each time you leave. Cause darling, I'm a nightmare dressed like a daydream. All right. Now here is the uh, staple Taylor Swift bridge slash i'm not even sure what to call it where she does this half rap thing um but what she's saying here and this this is almost like her making very explicit for us her message and her purpose what is she doing right she says boys only want love if it's torture boys only want love if it's torture there's the message very clearly. Thank you, Taylor, for doing our rhetorical analysis for us. Don't say I didn't, I didn't warn you. Don't say I didn't, say I didn't warn you. And there is her purpose. Perhaps this entire song is a warning. Or at least maybe that is media Taylor who is telling us this and singing this to us. Perhaps that's her purpose. Whereas real Taylor's purpose is to show us how ridiculous this media image that's been created of her really is so there are two layers happening here let's think about that purpose for a moment to warn you to warn you boys and girls uh but based on her language primarily uh, folks who are hoping to attract love from boys that love is perpetuated by its torturousness that is what keeps it going if it isn't painful boys will lose interest that's her warning so don't be a daydream dressed like a daydream don't be a nightmare dressed like a nightmare. Don't find out what kind of a girl he wants and be her forever or for a lifetime. Uh, don't be heaven. Don't be magic. Don't be nice. Uh, if you do, you will be disappointed, right? You'll get a never-ending carousel uh, of exciting, exciting love if you can manage to be both those good and bad things simultaneously. If you can add torture to it right if you can bring darkness to the light because without it then there is no light at all boys only want love if it's torture don't say i didn't say i didn't warn ya so it's gonna be forever Again, awesome to think of this song as one big satirical 
unit that is filled with all of these little paradoxes that poke all of these holes in a character that has been built by the media. And so we can find two purposes in it, really. We see media tailors' purpose um, to warn us about boys and love and how torture needs to be a part of it, but then real tailors' purpose. Uh, And maybe her purpose, right, because that one is so satirical and ridiculous, her real purpose, her real message is perhaps that all of this is nonsense, and that we should be nice and that love can be good and that Taylor Swift perhaps can be good as well. 